And um, her first lecture is about uh, disorder increases on masturbation. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. So I have to say that I'm quite impressed to give this lecture in for uh, such a uh, distinguished audience. And I will try to, um, to explain something which is uh, accessible to everybody here. So I guess uh, you have a different uh, background. So my um, idea is to tell you a story, a story about uh, art spheres or billiard balls. Maybe billiard balls is uh, even uh, uh, easier to figure out for uh, many of you. OK, and so um, actually this uh, art sphere is a system that I like very much. Not because I'm a great player for billiard. I'm uh, very bad, actually, for this. But uh, because the, this system is apparently very simple. OK, so there is uh, no quantum effect, no relativistic effect, nothing like this. So the system is just uh, consisting of n spheres, or balls in a dimension. OK, and so you have these uh, small spheres like this. OK, and so their radius I will denote by uh, epsilon. OK. And so uh, now the, the dynamics for this uh, system is very simple. OK, so either you do, do not uh, cross any other particle, and then uh, you have just a straight motion with a uniform velocity. OK, and so this uh, can be written uh, just uh, dvi over dt is equal to 0. So this is particle number i, say. OK, and then uh, dxi over dt is equal to vi. OK, but of course, this is uh, valid until uh, you uh, touch or collide another particle. OK, so this is valid until, uh, so as long as xi minus xj is bigger than epsilon. OK, and so of course, uh, if you would like to prescribe completely the dynamics, then you have to uh, say something about uh, the rule for the collision here. OK, but this rule is uh, quite simple as well. So the rule for collision, actually, you will ask that uh, uh, you have no overlap between the particles. OK, so this condition has to be satisfied all the time. OK, so this is one condition. There is another condition that uh, you uh, would like to impose is that uh, you will preserve both the momentum, the total momentum, and the energy. OK, so when you have a collision between, uh, say, particle i and j, then you uh, would like to have that vi plus vj after the collision is to equal to vi plus vj. I assume that all these particles are uh, identical, so uh, same, same mass and same uh, radius. OK, and that uh, their kinetic energy is conserved as well. OK, so this quantity here. OK, so then once you have uh, imposed this condition plus the fact that uh, the, the you have this uh, non-penetration condition, then you have essentially no choice. OK, so you see that when you have two particles which collide here, then uh, you know perfectly uh, this uh, velocity after the collision in terms of the velocity before the collision and uh, the direction here. OK, so we can uh, write this explicitly. So you get that v prime i will be equal to vi minus vi minus vj dot uh, xij, so nij I would call, okay, which is this direction here. And v prime j equal to v j plus v i minus v j dot n i j. Okay, so you see that uh, this uh, this is really uh, the simplest possible system that you can uh, imagine. Okay, and so um, actually uh, you can um, um, you can. Uh, try to see what you can say about this uh, dynamics. So of course, uh, if n is equal to 1, it's uh, quite simple. There is no collision, nothing like this. So that's fine. OK, this is uh, really uh, simple. If n equal 2, this is simple as well, because you can uh, just look at the, um, uh, say, uh, just as the center of, of gravity, the center of gravity as a uniform motion. And then uh, you just have to, to consider the motion of one particle. OK, so these two k's are really 
uh, uh, simple and you can write everything explicitly. So then if you are interested in the case when n equal to 3, then uh, just uh, go to Helmut. I think he will be able to tell you something. But uh, I say it, it's, it's already really complicated and it's uh, related to this three body problem that is uh, well known for, uh, been well known for a long time. But now if you think uh, of these uh, small art spheres as elementary particles in a gas like the air in this uh, room, of course, this is a very uh, uh, simplified model because we know that the particles are more complicated than this, uh, this art sphere, but say, so that can be the starting point. Of course, n will not be uh, neither one nor two uh, uh, nor three, but uh, really big. Okay, so that's exactly what uh, I will be interested in to say something about uh, the behavior of this system when you have a large, large number of particles. Okay, so before I say more on this uh, problem here, let me just give you some uh, very general property of this system. So the first one, and I will come back on this property uh, later on because uh, that will be important for, uh, say, the philosophical discussion about uh, this, uh, all these models. So the first one is that the system is reversible. Okay, so this is exactly like for uh, this uh, billiard balls. At some point, at some time, you decide to reverse all velocities, then you will go back exactly on the same path, okay? And so you can go uh, uh, back and forth, uh, no problem, you just need to reverse the velocities. Okay, another uh, thing is that, uh, of course, it's a little bit uh, degenerate, but it's an Hamiltonian system. So as long as n is finite, you expect something like, um, say, a Poincaré recurrence theorem, okay? So it's a little bit uh, degenerate, but, um, So of course, this suppose that you can have a solution for all times, okay? So maybe it's the first question that uh, you should ask. Is it true that uh, there is a solution for all time for these dynamics? And you see that actually it's not, okay? Because um, essentially you can see that uh, maybe at some point you can have three particles colliding at the same time, like this, okay? And then there is no rule that uh, like it's possible to have a, a unique continuation of these dynamics, okay? Because if you see that if you uh, collide these two b before this one, then it will change completely uh, the future, and the same if you start by this collision here. So if you have a triple point like this, then you have a problem. And also you will have a problem if uh, maybe you don't have this, uh, this uh, triple point, but you have kind of accumulation of uh, collision times, okay? So there, there are situations, there are initial configurations for which somehow this dynamics will stop at some time. Okay, but what you can prove is that actually it essentially never happens because this, uh, uh, so the system is uh, well posed <coughs> for almost all initial data. So actually, we don't care about uh, this initial data for, for which we don't have uh, solutions. Okay, so that's, say, that's what you can say in a very general fashion. And the other thing that you can say is that uh, this system actually is uh, really uh, 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 very inst unstable. Okay, if you imagine that epsilon is small, which is of course the case if you think about these uh, uh, atoms or molecules, you see that if you change a little bit, so something like the typical size of the particle, so if you move this particle from a distance epsilon, then you see that the dynamics will be completely different. Because in one case you will have a collision, and in the other case you will have no collision. And so you see that in the future, the, 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 two, the two configuration will be uh, quite far from each other. Okay, so this is the, the, the last thing that we can say, very uh, rough uh, thing that we can say that is, uh, clearly unstable. Okay, and then, uh, then it's question, what, what you can say when you have so many particles, the system is not stable, and you like to say that something on the, say, on the behavior of this gas, be able to, to, okay, in this gas, maybe it's not so important because uh, essentially everything is at uh, equilibrium, but uh, you would like to, to be able to say something, okay? So, um, actually, the, the regime I will be interested in is, uh, so a little bit special, okay, and I will, uh, 
I will try to explain this, uh, this regime. So what I will be interested in is this regime where you expect typically the, the particles to undergo a distance of the order of one before it collides be between two collisions. Okay, so, so what is important to uh, define this, uh, this regime is to define a mean free path. So actually this computation is a computation which is due to Maxwell, which is a very uh, uh, rough computation just to estimate this mean free pass. Of course, this is a, uh, this is a statistical, uh, this is a statistical uh, uh, estimate of this, uh, this uh, typical uh, distance between two collisions. And so the way you can do that is to say, okay, for the moment I will assume that, uh, so I have all these particles, but I will, uh, consider that most of them are just fixed on a lattice like this. Okay, maybe I should draw them a little bit bigger. Okay, so I have all these particles. So if I have n of them, of course, uh, I know uh, the distance between uh, two, the, the average distance between two particles. Okay, so now these particles are still of size epsilon here. And now I may imagine that I have just one particle which uh, is moving here. And I would like to know what, a, what is the typical distance that it will uh, uh, undergo before the first collision here, okay? So you see that essentially, if you are in the, the reference frame of this particle here, the way you see this obstacle here is just like something moving towards you, okay? So if, if you have the velocity here, what you see is kind of something like a tube, like this, okay? And so uh, the size, of course, the, the cross section here is something which is like epsilon to d minus one. Okay, so the section of the tube. And now the length of the tube here, see that it's, uh, say, in a time t, if the velocity here is v, the way you see this obstacle moving towards you is like v times t. <coughs> okay, so essentially the volume which is occupied by each of these obstacles in the reference frame of this particle here is like epsilon to the d minus one times v times t, and of course times n because you have n obstacles, okay? So this is a uh, uh, typical volume occupied by uh, the obstacles. <coughs> okay, and now if you would like say, this uh, typical volume to be, uh, say, when, so of course V times T is the distance that you, uh, that, that you, that the particles uh, run during a time uh, T. And so you see that this will be comparable to the effect of transport. So the effect of collision will be comparable to the effect of transport if this quantity here is of the order of one. Okay, so in this regime here, what you expect is kind of balance between two phenomena. The one is just transport, and the other one will be collision. Okay, so here you expect a balance between transport and collision. white ball will not have the same effect in terms of volume. If it's going away from somebody, then it will not be an obstacle. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But of course you see that it's, uh, it's, it's a very um, artificial situation because you don't expect all these particles to be at rest and you don't expect them. So it's just a very rough estimate on, on the typical volume, which is... So it's dense. It's really dense. Volume. Yeah, sure. Okay, so now what we will be interested in is to say, okay, uh, so you see that even though this problem is classical, actually the, the, there is something which has a little bit to do with probably with quantum mechanics and probably this, this, this work of Boltzmann that I will mention was somehow uh, kind of a precursor for, for, for this quantum mechanic, okay, because actually, of course, the system is very complicated, but you are not really interested in all deterministic paths of this system, okay? Because if you, uh, so there are two reasons for that. The first one is that uh, essentially you don't know precisely the initial condition, okay? 
If you have the gas here, of course, you don't know all position and all velocities of all small particles. Okay, so there are kind of uncertainty on the initial configuration. Okay, so this is the first reason why it's not really, um, say, relevant to look at one particular uh, trajectory of this system. Okay, and the other reason why it's maybe not relevant is that actually you are not really interested in, uh, say, one particular realization of this dynamics. Okay, so you don't care actually that, for instance, particle one is here and particle two is here, because for you, if you are just interested in the temperature of this room or in the, say, uh, the wind going through the room, you are just interested in on how many particles we will have here and which is a typical velocity, but you don't care that you can exchange two particles. Okay, so somehow what you are interested in are just average. Uh, are enough to describe a macroscopic behavior of the system. Okay, so here what uh, I, I will assume is that, so essentially the level we will try to describe the system is kind of intermediate between this very uh, microscopic description and the macroscopic description where only uh, uh, the temperature, pressure, and I don't know, bulk velocity are, are, uh, are given, okay? So this is not like fluid mechanics. Fluid mechanics, you are really interested in all these thermodynamic, thermodynamic variables, but you are not interested, say, in the typical behavior of one particle here. Somehow we will uh, just say at an intermediate level and so what we will be interested in is just to describe the typical behavior of particles. And so this, this, this I think, was really a, a very brilliant uh, idea of Boltzmann. So uh, let me uh, explain a little bit what is this theory. So maybe it's, uh, okay. So here, what you are interested in is to count the number of particles, okay? Here you just are interested in this typical behavior. So what you will do is just to count the number of particles with a given position or say approximate position and given velocity at a time t, okay? So here, the unknown will not be all this, this position, all these velocities at uh, any time, but just a distribution. So f, which is a function of t, x, and v, which is the probability density and which tells you how many particles there will be at a given position x and with a given velocity v at time t. Okay, so of course this kind of, of um, probabilistic, the probabilistic description was already used uh, before Boltzmann, but I, s I think actually Boltzmann was the first one to try to write an evolution equation for this quantity, okay? So I will try to explain you how we can uh, say, how um, um, you can find this equation formally from, from, this, uh, from this system of particles, and then I will explain why it's not so easy to uh, justify that indeed uh, this is uh, uh, the equation which really tells you something about the, 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 the typical uh, behavior of particles, okay? So, um, so you see that if I start from uh, this system here with n particles, and I would like to end up with a quantity like this, I have to do two different things, okay? So the first thing that I have to do is to um, somehow look at not just one configuration, so I, I could actually look at just one configuration and then just look at the, tip, the, the, the empirical measure. So actually there are two ways that you can 
uh, reach such a quantity here. So the first way you can do it is look at the empirical measure, which is just, so if you have n particles, you just look at 1 over n, direct mass xi of t, vi of t. Unfortunately, there, there is a sum here. And you see that when uh, n becomes uh, very large, then you expect this to be, uh, okay, to converge to something which is a, a continuous distribution like f of t, and then you see that here you have uh, the right number of variable. Okay, so this is one way to, uh, from this system of particles to obtain a density like that, okay? Now there is another way. So here you see that uh, you prescribe say essentially you, what you use here is just the fact that you have a kind of exchangeability between particles. Okay, so here what you say that what you are not interested in is just the, the, the labels of the particles, but then you keep everything about the, the deterministic dynamics. Okay, this xi of t, vi of t are really the solution of your uh, deterministic dynamics. Okay, so here really what is important and what say could be an important word for the, for the sequel is that you are not interested in making any difference between the different particles here, and so you really exploit the exchangeability, okay? Now, another way to uh, end up with uh, this, uh, this F here, and which is maybe uh, more uh, in the spirit of this uh, remark here that somehow you don't know exactly the initial configuration. So somehow it's not enough to average only on the on the, say, label of particles, but you would like also to average on, say, different initial configurations, okay? So this is the, 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 the other thing that we have to do is, and this is the second important word, is that you have some averaging process here. So now what you would like to say is that you will start with a distribution, okay? So now in distribution on this uh, very, very big phase space, okay? Because here you see the phase space, you have, uh, say, if the dimension of the real space is d, of course you have d dimension for x, uh, xi, d dimension for each vi, and then you have n of them, so this is a system of dimension 2dn, okay? So now you can uh, say that uh, you have uh, some uh, initial distribution of configuration, So which is a function, okay, on this uh, big space, so I uh, will call uh, maybe f uh, n0, which is a function which depends on, say, for the sake of simplicity, I will assume that the particles are in a torus, like this, I have no uh, boundary condition, okay? And this uh, initial configuration is really probably the density on this uh, phase space, okay? And so now I would like to uh, know what will be the configuration for, uh, for, for a future time, okay? And so what I say is that if the dynamics of the particles is given by the equation uh, over there, then I know how to propagate this distribution here and it's given by the Louisville equation, which is just a transport e equation, okay? Which tells you that essentially you will propagate this distribution here along the, the, the characteristics or along the trajectories of your system. Okay, so this Liouville equation is a very simple equation, although it's uh, on a very uh, big phase space, so it tells you that each particle, so the sum from i equal 1 to n, will be just driven by its own velocity here. Okay, and this is zero. And the only thing, of course, is that uh, uh, all the configuration uh, have to remain admissible, so you have to avoid all this overlapping. And so this equation now is not set on this space here, but on a, a smaller set, which is just uh, a set of, say, capital Xn, capital Vn, such that for all i, which is different from j, you have that Xi minus Xj is bigger than epsilon. Okay, so you see that now this, this uh, non-overlapping condition is prescribed here in the domain. Then you have this simple transport equation on this domain. And of course, 
you have to prescribe boundary condition, which correspond exactly to this uh, collision rule, which I've, I gave uh, at the beginning. Okay, so so plus boundary condition. So now you see that n somehow uh, it has far too many information in it. Okay, because now it tells you uh, the probability of any of this. Uh, configuration in this big, big phase space, of course, it contains much more information than this guy here. But you see that if you use both the averaging and the, uh, and the uh, exchangeability here, what you would like to do is to say that this function here will be just the first marginal of this guy here. Okay, so you, you, you just average over all position and, uh, and uh, essentially uh, what you do is just to integrate against this uh, this empirical measure here. And so uh, there is a very natural quantity, which I will call F1, let me smile this, F1 of n, which is just, I take this Fn here, and I integrate over, so x2, v2, etc., until xn, vn. And I just take this capital Fn of capital Xn, capital Vn. So what I call capital Xn, capital Vn is just the set of all Xi from 1 to n and all Vi from 1 to n. Okay, so now this function, you see it's, uh, it's really a function of T, X1, and V1. So it's something which should be comparable to this guy here. Okay, so I, s I say that there are two ways. So somehow the, the easiest possible way to get something like a distribution, like a probability density, is to consider this... Uh, this, this empirical measure, but somehow there, are, there is less averaging because you just average over uh, uh, the label of the particles, while here, okay, we assume that this Fn, maybe I should uh, say it, that it's symmetric. This is the assumption of exchangeability. So it's symmetric uh, uh, with respect to all arguments. You have this equation, of course, which preserves, so I should be, uh, okay, I have to decide between a small n and so you have this equation, which is a simple equation. And now you have a quantity, which is a good quantity because it depends only on t, x, and v, which is this quantity here. OK? So now, uh, since you have an equation here, you can expect to uh, know something about the dynamics of this guy. Of, co of course, OK? Since you know this complicated guy, uh, if you really know it, of course, you can just integrate. And then you will have something on the, on the, the first marginal. OK? So then both from the, do both of these techniques, or did you use this technique to get a good question? Actually, I think uh, none of them. I think it's uh, really a, a really a heuristic argument. So um, probably I, I will try to explain also a little bit uh, why it's, say, uh, natural to try to do something like this. But maybe it's, say, for me, it's easier to see this from this equation. but but. Uh, once again, uh, I, I don't think that it's written like this uh, in both manuals. Okay, so now I look at this equation. So I will try to integrate this. Of course, since I have an equation for f n, I will I can try to have an equation for this uh, first marginal just by integrating this equation. Okay, so first term, very nice, because of course the dt commutes with the with the integral with respect to x and v. Okay, so this is quite nice. Now this term is more complicated because you see that it's a vigrad x, but of course now you see that the d epsilon n, so this, this domain here, of course it's not the whole space, so you have boundaries. Okay, so when you integrate this transport, this, uh, transport uh, operator here, you will have uh, a term which is the transport as well, so you, you will keep this v1 grad x1, fn1, but then you get something here, we just come from Green's formula, which is the boundary term. Okay, so here you have another term, which comes from Green's formula. And so this is a boundary term. So what it means that you have a boundary term means that somehow you, 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 you obtain that x1 will collide with another particle. Okay, so you get that x1 will be exactly at a distance epsilon from one of the other xj. Okay, so what you should have is a sum over all possible j from 2 to n, okay? Because you have 
all these uh, parts of the boundaries, then you have an integral, say, with xj minus x1, which is equal to epsilon. You have to integrate uh, this uh, vi grad x, uh, so this vi, so vi, you, you will get something like v, vi dot uh, nij, where uh, with the, the, the same convention here that uh, nij is just uh, the, the vector between, so it's just xj minus xi divided by uh, its norm, okay, divided by epsilon. Okay, so you got this, and then you see that uh, this means that actually th th this guy here, it will depend both on the velocity uh, v1 and the position in x1, but also on the position on the velocity xj and v vj. You cannot integrate because of this, okay, you have something like v1 minus vj times n i, uh, so it's n 1j now, okay. And then you see that, uh, of course, uh, then you have uh, fn, but uh, it depends both on x1, uh, xj, v1, and vj, okay? So you cannot write this like uh, this marginal here. You still have two, two parameters that you cannot integrate. Because here you see that you have an explicit dependence respect to v1, and here it's a little bit uh, hidden, but uh, it's a dependence respect to x1. Okay, so I cannot integrate, I cannot write this guy in terms of fn1. Okay, so now it will depend on fn2. Okay, I have no choice. It's fn2, and then you have uh, x1, v1, xj, and vj. Okay, and uh, of course it depends on, on also on t. And that's it. Okay, so now you see that uh, it's not really fine because you don't have a closed equation. Okay, so of course you can work a little bit more on this equation. First of all, because uh, you can use exchangeability. So particle number j is the same as particle number two as far as your integrate. Okay, so you just can transform this sum here as uh, n minus one. Then you can use this the, the scaling of this guy here to rescale this. Uh, to have a vector here, which is a unit vector. Okay, so uh, you see that you will, you will have a n, which come, so n minus one actually, which come from this sum here. You have a epsilon to the d minus one, which come from this integral over the surface here, because now I will parameterize with the unit vector. Okay, and then I have a complicated thing. Okay, so something that I write c, one, two, f, n, two. Yeah, but you see that it's quite interesting because this is exactly uh, the Boltzmann grad scaling. Uh, so this scaling that was written here. Okay, so this tells you that essentially only if n times epsilon to the d minus one is of the order of one, you will see something where you have kind of balance between the transport here and the collision here. If this number is uh, say much smaller, then essentially you will have just transport and the particles will never see each other. And if it's much bigger, then uh, it's more complicated, okay? Okay, so then I have uh, uh, one more thing to do to explain a little bit the structure of this guy here because it will be important in the sequel. Um, so maybe I can just write here. I don't think I will use this. Because actually all the parts of the boundaries are not equivalent, okay? If you think, it to it in terms of transport equation, okay? If you have a very uh, simple transport equation, just uh, think about one particle just in a, say, uh, just on the domain with boundary here. You see that, of course, it's not the same for the transport equation to be a trajectory which will exit from the domain. Of course, you cannot impose anything on this trajectory. The particles, they are just going like this and they will exit the domain and that's it, okay? But then of course it's different because you on, on the part of the, the domain which is uh, somehow on the boundary where somehow the, the velocity are entering the domain because here you have to prescribe something. Okay, so for a transport equation, you have two types of boundaries. The part of the boundary which is just say the outgoing boundary and there you cannot prescribe anything. And then there is the other part, which is the on ingoing boundary, and then you have to prescribe something. Else you see that uh, if you just follow the characteristic, then you, you need to prescribe something here. here. So, so else you cannot say anything about the, the, the density here. 
Okay? So now you see that when I integrate over this, uh, this boundary here, actually I have the two parts of the boundary. Okay? And so the difference between the two parts of the boundary is the sign of this guy. Okay? So you see that essentially, uh, but it was already the case uh, here for the dynamical system, you see that actually what you have to prescribe is not is what will happen when, when the, the particle will collide. So if they collide, then you have to prescribe will, what will happen next. But of course, you, you don't need to prescribe what happens before the collision. Okay, so here this is the same. And so essentially, you have two parts of the boundary. So there is the um, so outgoing. You don't say anything. And then yeah, there is the ingoing part. And so for this part here, what you say is just that you have this reflection condition here. So what is called specular reflection. Okay, so you say that you have specular reflection. Which means that you can prescribe what will enter the domain in terms of what try to exit. Okay, so this is exactly this picture here of specular reflection. And it's very uh, something which is very intuitive if you know a little bit of, uh, I don't know, optics or things like this. You expect just this kind of <coughs> reflection. And of course, so this part will be uh, given in terms of what... Uh, uh, goes here. Okay, so somehow it's natural to um, to express everything in terms of what happened before the collision and not after the collision. What happens after the collision is something that you somehow you prescribe because you need this rule of collision. Okay, so you will separate this uh, this uh, integral uh, depending on the, the the sign of this quantity. So you have v i minus v one times say n. And you will uh, separate it in uh, two parts. Dot n minus. Okay. So this part, so the the the, the n is just uh, the uh, outward normal. So this means is if this guy he's here is uh, non-negative, this means that you are really outgoing, and so you need that you uh, that you are uh, ingoing in the system. Okay. So that's uh, particle. Width. And then you have to. Uh, you can say that this Fn2 can be uh, expressed in terms of what happens before the collision. Okay, so you will change here the Vi and and uh, so this is x1, yes, and x now is x2, say. So here I just change the velocity to say that I somehow I integrate in this formulation the rule of collision. And now oh, there is the, the part which was already uh, before the collision that I uh, led like this. Okay, so this is the typically the uh, how this uh, collision operator look like. Okay, but once again, uh, this is not really satisfactory because at this stage you have this equation. You have an equation for <coughs> F1, but this F1 will depend on F2. Okay, and so uh, somehow the really uh, the, the intuition by Boltzmann was to say that okay. If at time zero, my system is really chaotic, meaning that, say, the distribution of all these particles, all these particles, their law is independent from each other. Okay, it cannot be completely independent because they cannot uh, overlap, but say they are almost uh, independent. Okay, then maybe uh, in the scaling where there are not so many collision, then when two particles will meet each other, probably they, they they are still independent. Of course, after the collision, just after the collision, they are related by the fact, they are connected by the fact that uh, they, they, they had this collision in the past. But say when they, um, when they have their first collision, probably they are still independent. Okay, so the, the Boltzmann equation is exactly the equation which is written here for this Fn1, but where you replace this Fn2 by the product of Fn1. Okay, so this is what is called a Boltzmann uh, uh, chaos assumption. <coughs> so, you say that, and of course you need to be uh, really careful at this point, uh, I will comment on it uh, maybe later on, but you, you do really see that uh, this assumption is on the, the configuration which are pre-collisional. So 
before the collision, you hope that your particles are in independent. Of course, they are not after. OK, so this is really important. So this assumption is that you can replace uh, F2n will be almost the same okay, of t, say, z1, z2 is not so different from F1n t, z1, Fn1 t, z2. OK, so exactly uh, what is called independence in probability theory. So you just assume that particles are independent. So independence for, and this is really important, pre-collisional configurations. So now, of course, this is an assumption, OK? And there is no reason why, if you have a dynamical equation, which is the case here, because you have this equation which is written here, then you can prescribe something at time 0. You can prescribe something on the boundary. But you cannot prescribe that uh, at time uh, t in the middle of the domain, you have things like this, OK? So either it's true or it's not. But uh, somehow, it's not something that you can assume. You can assume, you can write the equation, but then it's not clear whether it will be a good approximation or not. Okay? So, um, somehow what I would like to do is, of course, not to enter the details of the, of the proof, but uh, I would like to state the theorem, which is a very uh, a famous theorem by Landford, which tells you that actually uh, this approximation by the Boltzmann equation is a good approximation. Okay? And then try to uh, give you some some tools, and these tools, I will uh, really uh, use them uh, uh, in a deeper uh, way uh, in the next lectures to really understand, say, uh, this question of propagation of chaos. And this is really uh, uh, this important thing about propagation of chaos. And also, say, how this, uh, this departure from chaos are, what you can you say about these correlations, and what can you say about the structure, all the correlation structure of this system. OK, so that, that's a really uh, uh, the point that I would like to, to share with you, because I, I find that uh, this correlation structure is really amazing. So I would like to, to spend more time uh, on it. But right now, what I would like to do is to give you this theorem and just give you, uh, say, some, uh, of course, I will not write many equations, many uh, techniques. But I will write, uh, I would like to, to give you, uh, say, combinatorial tools uh, to approach this question. OK, so let me uh, first set this theorem by Landford. So um, you start with the, your system. So consider a system of n odd spheres of size epsilon. And you assume, that, so it's not completely um, uh, it's a little bit vague, but uh, okay. That uh, uh, you assume that uh, initially they are independent. So independent once again cannot be exactly the case because, say, this non-overlapping condition tells you that they are not completely independent. But okay, up to this non-overlapping condition, they, they are independent. Okay, and identically <coughs> distributed. Say with a density f naught, and you should assume that this density f naught, so it's a function of t uh, of uh, x and v, and you assume that uh, for large v it's uh, really uh, a very nice function, so it's a function uh, which is uh, continuous and which has a uh, uh, good decay property at infinity. Okay, so this is a nice function. This is not very precise, I know, but okay. Then what you can prove is that uh, uh, in the Boltzmann grad scaling, so the Boltzmann grad scaling, you can prove that the empirical measure of the system, so Boltzmann grad means uh, that n times epsilon to the d minus 1 is, say, 1. Uh, the empirical measure of the system converges almost surely uh, 
covers almost surely. Uh, to the solution of the Boltzmann equation. And of course, there are um, one really important restriction, which is maybe uh, the, the really bad point from the physical point of view, is that this, ma unfortunately, this theorem is valid only for a very short time. Okay, so this time depends only on the norm of this function here, but what we are able to prove is only something like this, but for short times. Okay, for short times. And this, for the moment, is really a very challenging question. I, I don't think that uh, for the moment anybody has really uh, uh, any idea on how to go uh, beyond this uh, short time, and there are many reasons for that. I, I don't think I will have uh, time to comment on them, but um, okay. So I just would like to be, be before I uh, introduce this, uh, say this representation of the dynamics, which will be useful in the sequel. I would like just to, to come back on this, uh, on this, uh, on this question that uh, so or this notion that I, I mentioned at the very beginning, and this was the question uh, in the in the in the title of the the, the, the lecture. So there is one thing which is really uh, strange, okay. That if you look at this Boltzmann equation, it's well known because it's say it's somehow the first time that uh, we have a quantitative formulation of the second principle of thermodynamics. <coughs> okay, so this means that this Boltzmann equation has an entropy, which is uh, so for physicists a uh, quantity which is uh, increasing with time, but uh, for mathematicians uh, in general, this is a quantity which is decreasing with time. Okay, so that's. Okay, so anyway, you have a Lyapunov functional for this. So in particular, you don't expect this equation to be reversible. Okay, so you see that you start from something which is completely reversible. You do all your stuff, you have reached on blah, 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 and then you end up with this equation which is not reversible. Okay, and so somehow there is a natural question which is, and that's why is it will be important to comment a little bit about uh, and to try to understand this correlation structure. The question is, where the information, say, where is the missing information to go back? Okay, so this, this is really uh, uh, something really important, and that's actually why uh, the Boltzmann kinetic uh, theory at the beginning uh, was not uh, such a success, because actually people uh, didn't accept that somehow you can have uh, an equation like this, which is really a nice representation of these dynamics. Okay, because this one is reversible, while this this other one is not. Okay, so there is really really a question. About this theorem, uh, for short time, you know, how many collisions have happened? <laughs> a ridiculous number, <laughs> less than one in average. <laughs> one. So this th this doesn't mean that there is no collision. This co of course this is uh, in average, but uh, but but, but uh, sure, it's ridiculous. So, for instance, you will not, we, you will never see uh, relaxation towards equilibrium because, of course, this equation uh, somehow predicts the relaxation towards equilibrium and, and all this this kind of things which are related to irreversibility. Um, however, this is enough to see that uh, you don't have re uh, reversibility because the, the entropy, even on this very short time, uh, is uh, is uh, decreasing. Say. That the one reason why it's not, you cannot hope to do uh, really uh, something better uh, without uh, having really a new idea is that actually the, the Boltzmann equation itself is a very um, bad equation in the sense that you don't, n you don't need how to construct, say, solutions in the large. Okay, so essentially uh, the, this theory here is, is bad, but, but essentially you don't know how to do much, something much, uh, to get uh, large time. So the only way we can really uh, go to large time for, uh, say, uh, non-small uh, uh, non fluctuation is to use this renormalized uh, solution, and we don't have any counterpart of renormalization at, this, at the level of these uh, particles. Okay, so I, I think I have uh, maybe five minutes or something like this. Ten. Oh, ten. <laughs> so, um, so what I would like to uh, explain right now is say the strategy to uh, try to prove this theorem. Once again, I will not enter all the technical details and there are many things which are 
complicated, so I can just uh, name a few of them. So you see that the first thing is that uh, if you look at this collision integral here, this is a collision integral over uh, a surface of co-dimension d. So it's of course a, a, a problem if you uh, to define all the objects here. You also have problems with large velocity. So all these kind of things, I I, I don't want to uh, really spend a, a lot of time on, on them. Also, of course, there are major uh, obstruction or uh, major uh, technical difficulties that you have to overcome when trying to, to really write a proof. But what I would like to do is really to give you the spirit of the proof, okay? And so especially what I would like to do is to uh, show you how, you how we can represent these uh, different dynamics here, okay? So I think it's really uh, uh, the important thing if you would like to uh, uh, study correlations. Okay, so um, I don't think I, I, I think these numbers are completely crazy, but it's not uh, uh, really uh, that important. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, introduce this uh, tree representation of the dynamics. So let me uh, explain why you will have this tree representation. So here, you see that you will you would like to say something uh, on the the first marginal here, f1, okay? But then you see that if you would like to say something about f1, then at some point, so you will have a free transport, which is fine. So this part here, until the the, the time where you, you will collide, okay? Then you have f2, okay? So this means that after this collision time, if you really would like to know the history of your particle, at some you need uh, to know the history of uh, the two parents. Okay, so I start with one particle here, uh, which I call particle number one, okay? Okay, so this is the particle that I would like to know uh, the, the, the probability of, okay? And so what I say is that, uh, okay, I will uh, go back using uh, this first equation, which is here, okay? And so uh, I will go back with uh, just transport, okay? So this part is just transport until the time where it will collide and then it will generate another particle. Okay, this is this correspond exactly. So this branching here just correspond to this uh, operator uh, C12. Okay, so now if I would like to continue, of course, I need to write another equation here. Okay, so I would uh, need to write the equation for S. So I have this dtf1 plus v grad x f1. So this is 1, 1 equals C12 f2. And then if I would like to continue, I need to write the next one, so I have uh, now uh, capital V2, meaning V1 and V2, grad X2, F2, and then for the same reason, I will have a boundary condition, and then I will end up with a C23, and then I get a F3, okay? So this means that for a certain time, I will just continue with the transport here, so I will transport my two particles here until one of them will collide with another, another one, and then I get a tree like this, okay? So. This means that essentially I can represent all the dynamics, okay, all possible dynamics. So I can represent the solution as a superposition of all these trees. Okay, so I will write the solution, so F1, N at time T, so would be a superposition, meaning that I will have a s s sum and integrals of, say, these are not, of course, physical trajectories, but just of, of so, uh, so what we call pseudo trajectories, because they are not, you see that even the number of particles is not conserved, okay? This, this guy, there are just three, so you start with one particle and then you end up with a lot of particles. So, of course, this is a, a very complicated superposition because you have to, you have many parameters. So the first parameter that you have is the number of branching that you have, okay? So S will be the number of branching points. And then, of course, for each of these points here, you see that you have uh, a certain number of collision parameters. So, for instance, for this one, you need to know uh, when it will happen. So, you need uh, to know the time t2 where you introduce this new particle, which is a uh, priori random in this representation here. Then you uh, need to know uh, the velocity v2. And you, know also you need also to know exactly where you have added the particles close to particle number one. Okay, so you need to localize it on the surface. And so you have this part, this, uh, I don't know uh, how to call it, so omega two, which is just, uh, uh, say, the uh, impact parameter. Okay, and of course you have 
for all these branching points, you uh, have collision parameters. Okay, so you end up with a very complicated uh, superposition here, so because you have this sum over, so S can go from uh, one, say so if you say that S is the number of particles at the end here, it's at least one, of course, because you start with one, and it can be uh, something up to N, okay, no N, sorry. And then you have an integral over all the dTi, d omega i, and dVi of something, but the something here is just, so you start with this particle and then add particles. So uh, everything here is well defined once you know all these parameters, okay? And so now uh, what is important is um, why this representation here for the real dynamics is different from the analogous uh, representation for the Boltzmann dynamics, okay? And this uh, is really important, okay? So of course, uh, th so there are many differences. So the first difference is not so important. Actually, it's a little bit like technical. So is that, of course, when you add a particle in the real dynamic, the distance between the two particles is not zero, but it's epsilon. Okay, so this is the first dif difference. So you have a, a shift of order of size, say, epsilon at each collision. Okay, but this, you see, that's not really a problem. Okay, you can, you can deal with a shift. You will get two trees which are really close to each other. So if in the end, the initial data, so what you are constructing here is a very complicated operator, but which acts on the initial data. Okay, so it only depends on the initial data. So if the initial data is uh, very nice, then if you have all these small shifts, it's not a problem. Now the big problem, and it's related to this, uh, this uh, notion of propagation of chaos, is that, say, in the, 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 real, uh, in the, the real case for real particles, you see that when you have the transport here, maybe at some point the particle will recollide. Okay, because of course there are particles, they have size, and so uh, nobody tells you that maybe you will not, will not have a collision between these two particles here. Okay, so the difference is, the, the main difference between, say, the Boltzmann dynamics and, uh, and the, the, the real dynamics is that you have recollisions. And these recollisions, they are really your enemy. Because if you can prove that you have no recollision, then you see that up to this shift, essentially everything is stable, and you can say that, okay, the, the solution of the two hierarchies, so the Boltzmann hierarchy and this hierarchy here, which is called the BBJKY hierarchy, they will be close to each other. But now this recollision, they are really bad. Because you see that if you have two particles, so in the Boltzmann dynamics, essentially they will, you have just free transport, okay? So this part here in the Boltzmann dynamics is just free transport. Okay, so the, the particles, when they are, in, they are in this um, system here, they, cannot, they can never see each other again, okay? While, of course, if, if you write the, 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 the true equation for the dynamical system, here they can recollide because this transport here is on the domain and the, the, the particles still have a size, okay? And so you see that when you have a recollision, then uh, so in the Boltzmann dynamics, you will have something like this, they will just cross, okay? While uh, in the other case, I don't know, they will go like this and then uh, maybe uh, they will be deflected like that, I don't know. Okay, and then uh, of course uh, you are very far. You cannot say anything. So all the proof actually consists in, in, in proving that these events, these free collisions, will happen with very, very small probability. And actually that this probability converts to zero when epsilon goes to zero, okay? And so maybe just to, to end, just with uh, uh, the beginning of uh, an answer to this question of uh, irreversibility. So essentially what, what I say is that say all the missing information, so all what you would need to go back, say to just be able to, to go the, the other way in the, in the tree, is encoded in very, very small uh, sets. So of course, if you look at the average, you don't care about these sets, but still they contain a lot of information. So in, in terms of entropy, this means that you, per, you, you lose some information on the system because you have this Boltzmann equation. So each time you have a collision, essentially you lose something because you, you just uh, don't want to see these uh, recollisions. But once you, you say all this, this information which is missed is encoded in very small domains, so they are really small, we, can, we have estimates actually on these domains, but, but, but still the, the quantity of information on this domain is, is of the order of one. Okay, so 
That's why it's so important to really understand the structure of the correlation because somehow what we will see, and it's really amazing, is that you will have this um, correlation which essentially uh, exists at any scale. So on domain which have, uh, are uh, of size epsilon to the any power. Okay? So it's really uh, amazing, uh, this information. And actually, you have entropy, which is hidden on all these very, very small uh, sets. So that's uh, that uh, I will try to explain uh, tomorrow. But really, I, I, I would like you to um, just remember this uh, tree structure, because this would be really the fundamental uh, thing to, to understand this, uh, this structure of correlation. And uh, we will forget about the, all the equation and all, this, uh, all, all these things, and just play with trees. Okay? So here you see that. Say the, the proof of Landfors theorem is just removing the tree, which which are um, which are not so. S if you think of this in terms of graph, you see that a recollision is like a loop in the tree. Okay, and so really uh, the proof of uh, Landfors is just uh, proving that all these tree with loops, they are uh, they 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 their contribution is is really small, and then we will play with uh, many different uh, trees and see uh, how. We what we can say about uh, this uh, these correlations? Okay, I'm, I think I'm already late, so I will stop here. Thank you.